Today's podcast is brought to you by Toro Advisors, a premier New York City-based M&A advisory boutique specializing in mid-sized transactions of family-owned businesses in Latin America. I've known the principles of Toro for a long time and can vouch for their high integrity, sunny disposition, deep relationships in the region, and results. If you're interested in buying or selling a business in Latin America, I strongly recommend reaching out to Toro. You can find them at toroadvisors.com. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocatorsPodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Andy Golden, the president of Princeton University's investment management company for the last 22 years. Having grown from $3 billion at the time of his arrival to $22.5 billion today, Printco has been among the highest performing endowments in the world. Andy came to Printco from Duke Management Company, where he was an investment director, and received his formative training in the business, working for David Swenson at the Yale University Investments Office. Andy currently serves on the fund advisory boards of several well-known private equity and venture capital managers, including Bain Capital, General Catalyst Partners, and Greylock Partners. He was a founding member of the Investors Committee of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets and serves as a trustee of the Princeton Area Community Foundation and Rutgers Preparatory School. Andy holds a BA in Philosophy from Duke University and an MPPM from the Yale School of Management. Our conversation discusses Princeton's endowment two decades ago and today, including its strategic advantages as an institution, shifts in thinking about asset allocation, decision-making, team development, and partnership with managers. Andy's long tenure in the seat, his insight and wisdom provide a treasure trove of information about how a top endowment manager practices his craft, and his subtle wit always keeps things light. I hope you enjoy the show. If you do, please tell a friend, just one, and help spread the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Andy Golden. Andy, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. You have been here at Princeton for a while now. 22 years. 22 years in the same seat. So you started your career as a professional photographer, which is not the normal path to endowment management. How did you get from being a photographer to running the show here at Princeton? You know, I was a photographer really as a day job supporting artistic aspirations. (laughs) <laughs> and what interested me in photography was the idea that maybe I could do some art with it. And I remember getting very excited when I finally landed a day job in photography as opposed to before that. I was basically carrying heavy things and <laughs> I drove a truck a little bit. And then, of course, I had a lot of bartending. So I finally got the photography job. And along the way, after some uh, geographic moves, I ended up in the in-house advertising photography group for a department store. And I ended up kind of moving up the de facto ranks and getting involved in management. I was the assistant to the manager, not the assistant manager uh, of this uh, 10 photographer studio. And that actually got me interested in organizational issues. I was a philosophy major undergrad and I had not taken anything practical. The philosophical photographer. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, trying to uh, organize a bunch of folks to throughput work, I stumbled on this economic principle of adverse selection that (laughs) if you treat people really badly, then you're unlikely to get really great people working for you and it creates a vicious cycle. So I had this notion that maybe there'd be a better way to let workers share in the gains, the productivity gains that they um maybe they could produce. And uh, I knew I needed to learn more. And so I applied to the only management program that would even look at an application like mine, which was the Yale School of Organization and Management, as was called back in those days. And sure enough, I got in running an application about employee ownership of all things. 
The woman who's now my wife had a wonderful opportunity land in her lap that meant that I should defer, and I did defer my admittance for a year. Again, with no economic training, though I understood the idea of a free option, that I had the free (laughs) option to try something completely different. And the option would be that if I didn't like it, I could go to school. If I loved it, I didn't have to go to school. And so what I did is I went through the newspaper, saw an ad, took a math test, and started to work in a very small money management firm outside of Philadelphia doing technical analysis. I was essentially a human Bloomberg machine. Bloomberg had just kind of gotten started. This is uh, 1986. But we had a system called Quotron, and I would read numbers going across the screen and calculate them with my left hand and draw charts with my right hand. And it was really exciting to really be enmeshed in the market in that way. It was intense. And so I didn't like that job enough to stay, but I, I was fascinated by the market. And so when I went off to school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And investing was interesting to me, but I was concerned that it wouldn't be fulfilling as a long-term career because of the lack of kind of social impact. And I heard about this thing called socially responsible investing, and I thought, as many people you know, of that age think, wow, that, that sounds like cake and eat it too. I need to learn more. And I heard about this guy who had recently started working in the Yale Investments Office who had done community economic development work. And I was so naive about the world of investing that I didn't realize that those were two very different things. <laughs> so I, I went for Takahashi. Uh, Dean Takahashi. Uh, and I wasn't sure if that was his name or his title. <laughs> but I went off for an informational interview. And within somewhere between three and eight minutes, he convinced me that socially responsible investing was a silly concept and certainly not a way that not how I would want to spend my career. But if I was interested in doing good while investing, they were looking for an intern in really what was ground zero at time T plus two yeah. for this revolution that you know well, the Takashi Swenson model of investing. I can't, <laughs> I'm not allowed to use the Y word, yes, uh, the, the endowment model. And that I just felt like the luckiest guy. You know, I'd found a, a job that was just so fascinating and I, I would have stayed there. But for, as you know well, there's an economic issue that endowment management did not pay very well. That was okay. I was I had bought onto that, but Yale paid particularly poorly. And um, you <laughs> back know, back then, back, back then, then yeah. back then. But uh, so uh, Dave Swenson, I asked for his help, and he got me an offer to come to Princeton for triple my compensation. I got my own offer to go to Duke, the, my alma mater, undergrad, for double. So I took the Duke job and. Everyone in the Yale office applauded, not just because they're happy to see me go, but because it meant that <laughs> finally there was a data point of someone who wouldn't put up with the pay scale there. So I went off to Duke, and then 18 months later, Princeton called and said, hey, instead of actually being number two person in the office, we got some things going on here where we have a slot to run the uh, university office. Yeah. And that was 22 years ago. What? Almost as long as it took to tell the story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what what was here when you arrived and what did you felt you needed to change in the first couple of years? Yeah, th- there was very little here here when I arrived. And it's an interesting story about in some sense Princeton was a victim of its own success. Its investment track record of what was then a 3 point some billion dollar endowment was very, very, very strong. And so it hadn't really been motivated. There wasn't that much broken to to fix in, you know, at least in the trustees, you know, the governance powers minds. You can understand why. But Princeton had built up this long track record success in an unusual way. And for decades, there had basically been a, a single volunteer who made security level decisions and that went very well for a long time finally there was a shift to the use of a few a handful of outside managers but those were still selected by 
a trustee committee, although there was great deference paid to the chair's prerogative, or back then they would have said chairman's prerogative because it was certainly a man. And it wasn't until 1987 that there was any professional staff dedicated to this. And the uh, Printco, which is a university office, we're not a separate company, despite the name, was set up and the first Prinko president was chosen, and he will tell you this, I'm not besmirching him in any way, he will tell you he was chosen in part because he didn't have a whole lot of experience in investing, and so the trustee who had the most responsibility felt he wasn't going to get in the way. He's a tremendous smart guy who was a well-known entity to the university president at the time. So from 87 to 95, he served, he then followed Bill Bowen, his name's Dennis Sullivan, he followed Bill Bowen to the Mellon Foundation Second Pranko president came along, Randy Hack, who had, as his first career, he was a brilliant, tremendously successful real estate entrepreneur and well-known entity to the uh, inner circle of trustees. So he was brought in, but he had no real experience outside of real estate. He's trying to figure out this governance model where the, the chair really remained the decision maker. There was a Prinko president, but by no means was the Prinko president the true chief investment officer. And um, the chair at the time was a guy named Dick Fisher, who had a day job as chair and CEO of a little firm called Morgan Stanley. And Dick had the vision to put forward three initiatives that he felt were really going to be important in the 1990s. He knew that the 90s were not going to be the 80s. You weren't going to simply be able to make money by simply showing up Oh, well, turns out he got that wrong, but he got the idea right of diversifying into private investment, hedge funds, and also a, a third leg, which was a little, a little bit less clear, uh, was a good move, global balance management. Randy recognized that the private investment really required an intensity of effort that could not flow through the chair, so he constructed the idea for this affiliated fund, Nassau Capital. That was given an exclusive multi-year contract to manage our non-marketable. And he basically directly, took... Right? Direct, uh, yeah. I mean, they were holding on to it. They did both funds to funds and some direct investment, mostly co-investment. But he basically took what was a small staff, but he took essentially all of it with him. So I, I showed up here, and there was one colleague who was pretty frustrated that she hadn't been given the, the nod to lead the office, right. and two secretaries and a pretty much of a blank slate. And um, I spent the next several years trying to present a vision, simultaneously trying to improve the portfolio, present a new philosophy for a decision framework, present a vision for an organization that was first with Dick Fisher when his term ended, another uh, longtime trustee, Ed Matthews, who had been, at the time, was the chief investment officer for AIG. And it was Ed that really help move the, the ball forward on a new governance structure, which became a staff-centric decision model, fully empowered. Yeah, which is, by the way, which is pretty unusual, right, for an investment staff to have full discretion to make, like, it's mostly manager decisions at that point in time, right? Right, right. It was really unusual, and in fact, was not what I originally proposed. I said to, to Ed, I don't want to reinvent things when there's a good model, you know, here's a kind of Yale-like model where the major decisions, manager hires, fund re-ups, would still flow through the committee or what we'd call the Prinko board. There'd be a lot of kind of benefit of the doubt given that we, there's a presumption that if recommendations Innocent were- Innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, yeah. You know, you reject a lot of recommendations, there's probably a bigger decision that needs to get made. But Ed said, oh, Andy- Sounds to me like you're trying to have it both ways. You know, we're empowering you. I'm going to hold you account- accountable. And that, that was it's powerful. That was a big deal. And it, would, it did come with a little bit of the risks I was afraid of. And the, the biggest concern was that the Prinko board would not feel true ownership and therefore might get more concerned during tough times. Yeah, sure. And frankly, that wasn't a real problem because that authority model was almost immediately tested in 98 when there was a little bit of a emerging market and then bigger crisis, the long-term capital yeah, uh, sure. crisis. 
but it was more that the board was she would show up and say what are we doing here that you're, there's no decisions for us to make we're busy people yeah you know so we had to try and educate them about the importance of paying attention to us that they were to us the way we are to our external managers that we really need to know what's going on so as you framed out a way of thinking about managing this pool of capital what were the core beliefs that governed how you were going to go about structuring the portfolio. Then we talk a little bit about asset allocation and how you actually did it. Well, buy low, sell high was that's, one. That's, that's a good one. one. Yeah. No, I mean, in all seriousness, <laughs> I think it's a basic business principle about thinking about what you're trying to accomplish and where do you have advantages naturally, where can you acquire advantages, and where uh, might you have the disadvantage that's unchangeable. And, you know, so that's where you quickly get to the use of outside managers. Let's start with that. Why, why outside managers and not internal managers? I think, you know, the arguments are pretty clear that for any activity that we might pursue, and we pursue a lot of them, there are firms bringing just a whole lot more bandwidth. I won't even say firepower. I don't think that the people who work there are smarter than my colleagues, but they're focused and, you know, they're structured to reward and they're culturally just about really getting into the weeds. And, you know, it's hard to imagine us doing that across such a varied portfolio and competing well In each. against, yeah. you know, these specialized firms. You could take the approach of, well, then don't try and do it everywhere. Just do it in some areas or maybe even just one area. And I think where you run into problems there is from an organizational dynamic and a culture. And, you know, the rhythms of those decisions are so different that it's hard to bring a, a unified approach mindset, unified talent. You know, there's a, a reality of the compensation market that in the private sector, comparing private to private, security selection in the trench work gets paid a whole lot more than fund to fund work. Mm -hmm. And so even though to this day, places like Princeton operate at some discount to the private sector on the fund to fund basis, not much, but still some, it's a huge discount to the front line. You know, this is the issues that Harvard you know, had. And it's even worse than that. Not only are we at a disadvantage in terms of that compensation element, in terms of attracting and retaining people, there's a danger that it weakens an area where we have an advantage, which is this sense of mission. So what attracts people to Prinko, I hope, I know, are the same four things that I'm attracted to. First, the intellectual challenge is really special. All over the world, all different kinds of things, you know, we get to take a very, in fact, we have to take a very long-term horizon, but we know that the long-term comprise lots of short terms. To coordinate this portfolio, we necessarily have to have the 30, 35,000 foot view. I mean that literally and metaphorically in terms of, you know, the, the, the travel, but we also swoop down from time to time and operate shoulder to shoulder with our external partners and the ways out. I think in the data support, make each other better. So that's really cool. We're given all the tools that we need to compete to be the very best at what we do. Got some tough competition, but no one has any additional tools than we have. You know, but that's the third one is really the distinctive, the sense of mission. And frankly, operating at a slight compensation discount underscores that and makes you feel really good. You know, the fourth one, I used to stop at three because that's where the rhetoric coach would tell you, have three points. Only three points, yeah. Yeah, but the fourth one that I realized is that I get to come to work every day with colleagues who share, you know, interest in that the same three. Again, that's all culturally that we feel really good about what we're doing and we feel that we are delivering a bargain, you know, to our client, which is kind of us, but we're delivering a you know, a bargain. So that's 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 yeah. why. So that's a first tenant was the use of external managers. And what are the other key advantages or disadvantages that you have sitting here? Well, the, you know, I mentioned that the long horizon is a potential advantage. There are some other ones, like the fact that Princeton itself and then Prinko has augmented this. We're an attractive client, and that's enmeshed in the ability to take a long term. You know, there's um. There's a saying that good clients make for good architects. It's also true that good bosses make for 
good workers. And so the fact that our governance structure is filled straight up and down the line with people who really are not just brilliant, but get it, like, you know, understand investing. And so, you know, getting back to that buy low, sell high, it means you're buying what everyone else is selling and selling what everyone else is buying. It means you got to be contrarian and it means that you got to be able to do some uncomfortable things. And people who understand what you're doing will allow you greater units of discomfort and they will also allow you to optimize that discomfort, spending them in ways that are counter to conventional wisdom. So, uh, you know, we got this loyal network, it's an information network of Princeton alums, but also Prinko alums or Madgeware. So why wouldn't I want to exploit that intelligence? And, and, and you know, I don't want to compete against those managers. I want to kind of work with them. So I think those are, uh, you know, some of the uh, obvious ones. You mentioned the, a potential long horizon. Most of the time people in a, in a seat like yours talk about having a long horizon. So why don't you talk a little bit about the word potential in that phrase? Well, first of all, you got to talk about long and what we mean by long. Uh, there's a phrase we use here that we actually think BLT, we think beyond the long term, because a lot of people say, you know, long is 10 years or something. And I think, well, I'd like to push our thinking on that. You know, I'd like to not just produce the best possible results over the next 10 years, but I want to make sure that in doing so, at the end of those 10 years, we have a program that really looks like it's got unfair advantages for the next 10 years. So, you know, that's that's pretty good if you can do that. But the real horizon is not what you claim your horizon is. The real horizon is this thing that you maybe don't even discover until after the fact. It's how long can you go with a large amount of discomfort without changing your path inappropriately? One of the things I love about this business and I love about what I get to do in terms of focusing on the long term is it brings back the philosophy for me, right? It's like, if you set up a system where you say you won't really know how well you're doing until the long term is done, wow, that sounds a little odd. That, that means you're going to ignore all information along the way? So being able to figure out when you should pay attention to the short-term disappointment is really interesting. And I think that speaks to another advantage that we've had to develop around here which is both the appreciation of theory. We don't use theoretical as a term to denigrate something. We use it to mean not empirically based. Being able to have an appreciation of theory over data in the right balance is key. You know, there are times when you want to say, if the data don't support the theory, the data are wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so... You, Anyone listening is scratching their head at this point, and you can say, see why this is an acquired advantage, because when I used to say this stuff one year, two years into it, people would scratch their heads and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so another advantage is if you put up good numbers for long enough, all of a sudden, everything you say sounds a whole lot smarter yeah, than it used to. you do sound yeah. a lot smarter <laughs> than I remember from yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. What's an example of let's just talk about a manager, and it would be a specific manager, of what happens when a manager is going through a tough period of performance. Yeah. What are you doing to figure out what's right, the theory or the data? We want to talk about, in the first instance, what's the simple explanation, the kind of attribution, but we don't want to get too involved in that. You know, attribution studies tend not to be worth the paper they're written on, and I believe it or not, can go on long about that. I think that's a kind of step into the, what, what's really going on here, guys? And let's, let's talk about not what's happened, but what we think, what the future might look like. So let's go through a portfolio and understand what your arguments are for this position versus that position, and see if we can get you know, confidence in, from, from that perspective. You, of course, want to, maybe the short answer is you want to just re-underwrite. And if, if you have experience like we have of investing with people who don't have a long track record, it's not that unusual. It doesn't feel that strange to invest despite a recent bad track record. It's, it's not that much, no, no big deal. You know, so what are we trying to think about? We're trying to think about 
who the people are, what m- motivates them, and what are they doing? Do they have a, an approach that can give them an edge, and do they seem to be executing on that? You know, you rarely have to relook at that point at some of these other kind of agency issues. People tend to develop bad habits when things are going well. <laughs> In terms of separating interests with clients, not when things are going uh, badly, although it may be an opportunity to to reexamine some of those collegially with our partners and see if there's a some strength thing there. But you know, you're really looking at things to just kind of understand the the hows and whys. It's one of the reasons why there's a bunch of strategies that we don't invest in, even though others have made a ton of money. But we know that when the bad times come we would not be able to do anything to give us confidence to continue. So what, what's your, what are examples of those? Like you know, any, any black box, yeah. you know, any trading strategy where someone's just got a market feel. Someone may have also flipped heads, you know, a hundred times in a row up to that point, And now they've just done tails. So as you espouse the goals for the pool of capital, I was surprised to see a very high return goal, at least in these market conditions. And the reports say, I mean, the annual report of Prinko says above 10% a year. And then you want to generate high returns, beat market indexes, beat your peers. How do you set up your asset allocation to try to get at those goals? Yeah, although the above 10% is shorthand. It's, you know, we think about things in real return space. Sure. And then we're assuming, you know, a reasonable level of inflation. And this is a conversation I think we all need to be sensitive to and both the recent market, but also going forward, is you got to be consistent in what you're saying. If you think inflation is going to be low, then your nominal return is going to be low. But that's not so bad. I would sign up for that any day. You know, if I can make five or six percent real compounding forever, I would sign that. And what's approximately the spending of the university? Well, the, uh, the spending is probably going to average a little north of five, according five to our nominal family. or five five. Well, in any given year, it's nominal, but it grows. You know, so to correct what I'm saying, if someone said, if devil walks in and says, here's a contract, you can earn exactly 5% real, I'm not sure I would do that. We'd have to readjust our spending approach. But if they said something closer to the six, you, for sure, you would do that. So your asset allocation question, we think about asset allocation a little bit differently I'll give you the answer I would have given to you three years ago, and then I'll give you the answer Great. today. The answer three years ago would have been, we think about asset allocation a little bit differently. We very explicitly and intentionally divide our asset allocation decisions up into two buckets. The, the longest horizon bucket's called our policy portfolio, and it's constructed in a valuation-independent framework. That means we're not looking around at what looks particularly good right now or bad. We're saying... What are the kind of core beliefs about investing the way asset classes perform and what are their characteristics and what are our distinctive circumstances, including our objectives as an investor, and create this default position, this neutral position that addresses that? I think a lot of investors fail to recognize that there is no one right portfolio. It's right for what you're trying to achieve. Princeton should have a very different portfolio than my 89-year-old mother should have for so many reasons. Even though they're both going to live forever. Apparently. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mom, if you're listening, I I want that to happen. uh, You know, so you you think about things like how much illiquidity can you tolerate, et cetera, and you create that base level positioning. It's then in step two that we say, is there anything unusual going on either in the world or with ourselves that suggests that we need to recognize a midterm target that's different from our long-term target? And so that, that's the three years ago framework. Right. And what I don't know if it's varied that much, but that baseline long-term independent of market conditions asset allocation, what, is, what does that look like roughly? You know, we, we have to earn a lot of money, so it's equity biased. If we just kind of go around the pie chart, it's 10% dedicated to domestic equity long-only managers, 6% to other developed markets, longish-only managers, 10% to emerging market public equity managers, 25% in the category we call independent return, 
subset of what the world calls hedge funds, what many others call absolute return, 25% in private equity as a long-term target, that's venture and buyout, 19% in real assets, that's real estate, energy, timber, some other things in public and private format, and then if I said that right, at least 5% in fixed income. You know, the midterm allocation is quite different from that. For the first half of the 22 years, those differences were all intentional. You know, we could see there were such dislocations in markets that even we you know, felt confident in swinging hard at them. What's a, give an example of that from back then. You know, decrease your domestic equity exposure as much as you can tolerate in general and against the tech sector in particular and move it into emerging within domestic, put as much as you possibly can into value. And so so we, we did well kind of coming, you know, at least relative base coming yeah, out okay. of the, the bubble because of that. You know, what's gone on for close to the second half of that 22-year period was this, we developed unintentionally an extreme overweight to private equity. Through the crisis. Yeah. yeah. And even leading up to it, we were okay. steering that 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 boat was moving pretty fast for us, and yeah. uh, and so then it became a well. Given that you are overweight, that and given that there's um, no way that you are interested in at least in kind of correcting that quickly, then why don't you be very deliberate and intentional about how you offset that? And so the conversations now are much more about which do you dislike least in yeah. terms of holding the, the smallest amount of a. Uh, that underweight. So that's been the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. No, it, yeah. It hurt me. You know, it's like we're really overweight, and that's part of why we, we've done better than we w- would have otherwise. Sure. It's still, you know, since 2009, the frustration has still been that not just zero return to diversification, there's been a cost to diversification, but there's also been a cost to hard work. <laughs> like, yeah. well, S&P 500, right? <laughs> just show up, you know, the, the Woody Allen approach yeah, to uh, 20, investing. 20 years now that's worked. Well, let's walk through each asset class briefly. I'd love to hear your take and your particular spin on on each. So U.S. equities, it's only 10%. Right. Presumably that's not indexed. It's the opposite of indexed, yeah. So how, how have you approached sort of when you when you only have that much exposure to the U.S., what are you trying to accomplish and then how do you go about doing it? Well, it's quite different from what you might expect. So one of the things I should have said about a core belief and a, a tenet here, um, I'm going to steal a phrase that one of our managers uses, that it's uh, one team, one dream. So our whole decision process is structured in the hopes of moving closer and closer to that nirvana. Nirvana would be if every single investment truly competed against every other single investment. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, what? You know, we never really fully answered. The asset allocation process today is really bottom up, and it's kind of we like this manager, we like that manager. We think it makes sense to have this much money with that one, and that you know with that one. And when we aggregate that all up, is that a tolerable position? You know, we're not oh, fully there yet, different. but we're not. We don't articulate it that way. We think the construct is still helpful as a just a uh, almost a trail markers, but um, more often than not. If there's a manager that we like, but it would put us over the the kind of allocation, that's when we talk to the board about changing the allocation. Do you change the allocation, or will you just port over the exposure, which is another sort of viable? So if you had a framework of an asset allocation and you had too much in U.S. equity, you could either short out or swap it into development yeah, market equity. Yeah, we, we, we do a little bit of that, but it's in the first instance, it's more, well, that 10% in domestic equity – it's an arbitrary number. Do we really think it's much better than 9% or 11%? Well, it depends how you make it up. So that gets us back to the one team, one dream. We try really hard to not think about these things as silos or you know make them justify themselves relative to just themselves. So within domestic equity, we've got 40% of that 10%. Your listeners can do the math. It's about four points with just one manager. Right? If you were running a domestic equity portfolio, if you were compensated on just how domestic equity did, you would never take that much tracking risk. But everyone who works here is just thinking about the overarching 
bottom line. I guess your bottom line should be underpinning. Your bottom line should be on the bottom, <laughs> not <laughs> not on the, on the top. And you know, we want to kind of partner with great people, and then we figure out which bucket makes the most so what sense type of manager are they in a particular sector or are they a broad u.s equity manager that just happens to have a lot of conviction no uh wait for it these guys uh you know who uh we're, many of our closest friends invest with them do uh biotech stocks fallen angel biotech stocks yeah yep. so you're not just concentrating you're concentrating on you know a sector that can be quite volatile that is pretty distinctive and by the way, we got some exposure in that area and other parts of the you know, portfolio there as well in the independent return and even in the uh, venture space. You know, but I think most institutions are much more prone to over-diversification or its cousin de-worsification, as Pierre Lynch would say, uh, than they are the opposite yeah. uh, issue. And that's where a lot of this, again, all is of peace. If you've built up confidence in yourself, your own team, but also you've inspired kind of like confidence from the governance structure. You can do those things. You can do those things, and you, you feel like, well, if I do have an advantage that others don't have, uh, which is the possibility for uh, lessened agency issue drag, the mm -hmm. fact that others don't live with us day to day, and so we can do things, you know, they, they might be concerned that we'd be doing things that they wouldn't like, but when you build the confidence, then you can say, well, look, you know that we right. have this 4% position. I bet you that in the next 10 years, there'll be a time when, when we stand up and do that attribution I was talking about, we have to say, and a large share of it was due to, you know, this outside position. Oh, well, you know, right. remember right. all the good that did up to that point. So do you envision as this rolls out five or 10 years from now, the portfolio could be Mostly bottom up. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's at least one peer that describes it exactly that way. I'm not sure that I'm willing to give up this framework, immediately heuristic framework. I think um, it serves useful purposes beyond the actual decision of how much money to give each manager. One of our strengths, again, is well, we got a, a great set of bosses or partners. I'd prefer to think of. Them, but they're managing partners. <laughs> yeah. They can fire me. I can't fire them. And um, these are people who come with a lot of experience in investing. But most of them come with experience investing in one particular area as opposed to, say, the fund-to-fund -fund sure. framework. And this is just one example of why I like still the um, top-down terminology. And so if you come and you're um, used to investing in buyouts, liquid buyouts, you might look and say, you know, you're less familiar with real estate and you say, boy, that real estate performance has not been nearly as good as buyouts. You know, why are we doing any of that? And if you have the language of, you know, portfolio theory, you can explain, well, because it still plays a role. And it's cyclical. And yeah. And sure. it's it's it, it's time will come, but but remember that ex ante, you know, we we did not think it was going to be competing against any one particular category. It's whether or not the thing as a whole, right? Where's a pure bottom up model? You can see how yeah. you can get into those natural habitats of people's knowledge experience base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's turn a little bit to independent return. I know that's an area where you started off many years ago at Yale focusing when, at least in the hedge fund area, absolute return at Yale, there were, I remember you had a sheet of paper that listed all the hedge funds. I think it might have been two sides, maybe one and a half. The, the ones in the world, not just in the, in the world. In the right. world, yeah. 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 Quite a bit different today. So how, how are you thinking about it uh, in your portfolio? How do we think about the role? Or, or the do role we, do we like and it or, uh, the area, yeah. fees, all the, all the relevant issues. Yeah, you know, if we were condemned to produce the median return of the hedge fund space, there's, I don't think we'd have any allocation. So um, it's a little bit of the act of confidence, some might say arrogance, that you know, our opinion of the asset class is quite different 
if if you want to call it master class the opinion of you know the that collection of managers is quite different from the opinion of our 15 or so relationships that we have there so wow 15 relationships and it's 25 percent right of the pool so if you start doing the math that's a lot of money with each manager on average yeah on average. it's a barbell approach like a lot of things that we do here you know some are very big numbers yeah. and some are much smaller and the ones that are big have they those tended to be really long relationships yeah we don't step up and say here here's four percent of the endowment we've never met you before but you seem like a nice chap so <laughs> nice gal <laughs> you know let's yeah so uh in part because a lot of them have grown to that size the old-fashioned way you know they've they've earned it they, um, have. they have uh you know many of these go back you know the the relationship predates my coming to princeton yeah. you know there's a, folks have done business with for so a lot of those firms you know, both well, through so, organic compounding and then some of them through through growth and in, in acquiring assets are much much bigger today than they were 10 years ago certainly 20 but it's really the last say 15 years where there's been a tremendous amount of growth how do you think about that whole notion of balancing you know, size as the enemy of performance as these guys grow? Can they extract that much yeah. return in dollars from the markets? And, and at what point in time do you say, huh, boy, they're awfully big. You know, we probably wouldn't give money to that fund if we hadn't had money with them for a long time uh, to get to this point. Yeah. So you'll hear me talk a lot about vectors, things that push a decision one way or the other. And obviously, there are a lot of things that would make, should make one skeptical about ballooning assets. You know, on the other hand, the world's a lot more complicated. And there are certain strategies where the size actually helps. Now, those strategies bring with them a different kind of risk and a different kind of calculus. You know, there are some who have been very successful at keeping a war chest through long periods of time so that when there's a highly motivated seller who really needs help with a problem, the fund can step forward and you know, write a billion-dollar check. So whether or not that's a approach that is attractive depends upon some implicit calculations that you're making. The drag of that dry powder. And how often are they going to get Versus how to often yeah. and how big is it going to be. Right. And even if it's not dry powder per se... It's not amazingly great investments while they're, they're waiting. Sure. Right? So this is where um, you get to the – there are several different ways that the cat can be skinned, several different ways that we're interested in backing. But those ways have to make sense when viewed as a whole, you know, with um, everything else that's going on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, so you, some firms scale a lot better than other firms. And I think it's one of the um, key challenges of investing is how does a firm develop? How does it grow? Right? Because it's not just asset size, it's evolution of strategy. And there's a natural tension. You know, there's a lot to be said for sticking with your knitting and doing the thing that got you there. But it turns out that the world may not reward that the same way. And so it isn't a question of are you evolving is the question is are you evolving smartly in a way that you know inspires that confidence and on the private equity side you know, let's talk a little bit about the the buyout portion of the equation rates have been low it's given buyout firms chance to have cheap leverage for a long time returns have been great on the hedge fund world for the last 10 years where returns haven't been great now you're seeing particularly probably starting with the later movers, the public pensions, a lot of fee scrutiny. And it makes sense, right? If returns are mid-teens, you can extract more in fees than when, when they're you know, mid-single digits. Private equity world, people are starting to wake up to, huh, that's a deal fee, and that's a monitoring fee, and that's an exit fee, and oh, there's a management fee. But the returns have still been high enough that the capital is still strong. What's happening now in the sort of GPLP relationship with private equity firms? And, and what are the types of firms that you embrace as you look forward for the next 10 years? On the specific point about fees, we believe it's important to optimize fees, not minimize fees. Sure. And we want to make sure that the firms actually have you know, revenues to the principals that are enough to make them silly rich without 
having to find some other way to justify themselves, like garnering assets beyond the point of being able to execute their strategy, where it no longer makes sense as a whole what what they're trying to do. So we're a little bit less hawkish on some of these things than others are, but you know we still care a lot. And there's this idea that even the low end of the fee scale only makes sense if the firm is really capable of returning excess return, right? <laughs> it's like, if they're not capable of that, then the chances are you could cut the fees you know, by a very nice haircut and it still wouldn't make sense. You know, one of the things that I think we found useful is to kind of reframe some of the ways others talk about this and talk not so much about alignment of interest, although that's important, but there feels like there should be a better word than interest. That feels like there's a contractual element of it. And I've been test driving this phrasing of alignment of appetites. I want to make sure that the natural inclination, the appetite of the managers fits well with our own appetites. And you know, so we're looking for managers who are competitive folks, but they're competing on producing the best possible returns subject to making themselves, as I said, silly rich, as opposed to just trying to make themselves as rich as possible subject to producing good enough returns that that, that, that happens. And if you can you know, find folks who are motivated that way naturally, not by contract, then you can start talking about some contractual things that do help to align the interests at that point over the horizon of the contract, you know, you can agree that base level fees really should not be the source of major wealth. They, you know, we should understand what the compensation market is, the labor market is, you know, to get a talented person and tell them that you're going to be unleashed in this wonderful place that's going to, you know, you're going to get to do what you think makes sense and create a lot of value and, you know, be proud of that value created. You know, how much do you have to pay that person to show up to work each day given that if things do break the way they would expect them to, then they will get that lucre raining down on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. So, you know, on the, on the fee side, you know, you're, you mentioned this kind of layering and, and uh, opacity of where money's going. You know, again, it's a kind of, does this system make sense? You know, we certainly want to have disclosure, but we need to understand does it make sense? If a firm is providing a lot of value creation services to a company that would otherwise you know, have to be shopped out, well, let's see, does that compensation make sense? You know, in some cases it does. In some cases, it's, oh, you want a fee for selling a company, you know, because you minimally used an investment banker? I don't know. You know, you're already getting your incentive fee slice of that, that feels a little funnier, right? As opposed to, oh, you did this consulting study that, that said, you know, you know, here's who your customer should be. Let's talk a little bit about your team here. Where have you found the people on your team and how are they structured? Uh, I tend to find them under their desks. And <laughs> <laughs> That's most days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, definitely blessed by having a lot of great colleagues and where we have found them is not necessarily where we think we'll be finding them going forward. And another core belief was that we do a whole lot better by growing our own talent. But when you're at certain stages, you can't wait. You can't plant the vines and wait for the grapes and then age the, you know, so if you look at people who are here, you know, we're, we're marked by some pretty long tenured people. And some of those longest tenured senior people were lateral or lateral-ish hires. But where we think the future of Prinko is, is mostly, if not entirely, on our grow our own. And so we're hiring one to three or or maybe more kids out of college, primarily Princeton, where we have some unfair recruiting advantages. And, um, you know, it's exciting to see them develop. It's another form of compensation. And what we're really looking for are first principle thinkers as opposed to learn a recipe and just use that recipe, which is one of the reasons why it's often difficult to bring the lateral hire in because they've, they've got a certain way of doing it. And it's, it's hard to know just through any kind of recruiting engagement 
whether or not they will be the type that will adapt to a somewhat different set of circumstances when appropriate, uh, because all the stories are talking about what they've done in the past, you know, all made sense <laughs> then, but we don't know if they'll make sense going forward. And then with, with this one firm, one goal, does that filter through to how you organize responsibilities of the people on the team as well? Yeah. So at the senior level, we've divvied up the asset categories so that there's someone who feels ownership that helps avoid cracks that sure. stuff may fall through. Yet everything's a gang tackle. And I'll explain that in a second. I'll say at the junior level, we've experimented with lots of different ways and they tend to change depending upon who the athletes are, of giving people broad exposures, not necessarily always cross-sectionally, sometimes it's serially over time, to try and give them the ability to compare and contrast ways of thinking, to, to make their lives more interesting. It helps recruit people when they feel that they're at less risk of being pigeonholed into something. But the gang tackling you know, for the major decisions, we had one this, this morning. It's all hands on deck. It's all 16 investment professionals sitting around the table. Everyone's gotten a, a packet uh, for what we're calling the bull bear session. We've assigned not just proponents, but some people to play devil's advocate. And they go at it and kind of present opening arguments as to, you know, here's why we should and here's why we, we shouldn't do it. By the way, everyone who walks in the room, the first thing they do is they get a ballot and they have to say what their vote is going into the meeting. Hmm. And then at the end of the meeting, they write down what their vote is. And then that piece of paper is set aside. And then we all show our votes simultaneously through a set of hand signals. And then there's a super secret, um, not necessarily stable algorithm that's in my head as to how those votes get counted. So, <laughs> so we're you know making the uh, we have a summer intern here who is in her second day and she voted. It turns out that her vote doesn't have quite the same weight, you know, as as yours, perhaps. Well, maybe as much as mine, but not as much as you know my colleague John Erickson, who's been here for nineteen years. And so, you know, that's that kind of one team, one dream gang tackle. You know, to process information efficiently, it's not everything we're doing is all the time, right. <laughs> everyone involved. So you have to create a, a deal team. Yeah. Uh, and that gets constructed. There are certain tendencies of people who do more work in a category. There'll be mostly representation of that, but there'll be someone else who is getting a, a visit into yeah. that world. That, that process, that kind of bull bear process, how long ago did you start thinking, hey, this might be a great way for us to enhance how we make decisions? Yeah, so this uh, is directly connected to the, the GFC or you know, the global freaking crisis, as uh, we like to call it. And uh, the warning is it's a process of that rotating assigned devil's advocate sounds a whole lot better than it actually is. We still haven't cracked the code as to how they're really implemented. But the reason I say it came out of the the GFC is because when the dust hadn't settled by yet, but when I was emotionally capable of inward reflection, on the, I remember this plane ride. I said, well, let's think about the 10 worst decisions, investment decisions that you, Andy, or Prinko has made. And let's see if there's anything that we can figure out. And it was very careful to say, as always, you know, to differentiate between bad decision and bad result. And well, I, I only got to about number seven or eight, when I realized that more than half of them shared this characteristic of there was some kind of political element that, and I want to be careful what that word means, some kind of element in decision process that can be traced back to the old style where you know, I was always the last line of defense. I, I mean, I still am, but I played the kind of skeptic, you know, I'm going to argue against you proponents. And I realized is that it was easy in that framework for there to be these kind of said political or maybe it's emotional elements to push back three times in a row on someone's idea creates a risk that they're going to get frustration that is incommensurate with the sure. lack of quality of the idea. So you begin to say, well... That's balancing your judgment against being supportive. Yeah, you know, all right. Yeah. 
I think this is probably a B plus A minus. You know, if it's a B minus, forget we're not going to do it. But right. you know, it's a B plus. Well, maybe it's an A minus. Okay, you know, I could be wrong. Right. And it worked the other way as well. You know, my I wanted to do something. My colleagues would say, uh, "Gee, we think it's kind of like an A minus." And when they say that, they mean they think it's a B minus. Uh, <laughs> right. And I would say, "Oh, these people." We are agreeing that there's this hair on this thing, there's this risk on this thing, but they're just too risk averse. So to make that, it depersonalizes to say that you're playing an assigned role. Let's see how strong your argument can be, you you colleagues, and take a little bit of the power dynamic out of it. You know, at the end of the day, I'm still counting the votes. So, you know, I'm still that last line of defense. But, you know, it's definitely more helpful. As I said, it sounds like a great idea when I've ever told he says, oh yeah it's just really hard to figure out how to execute it you get these discussions that are orthogonal someone you know says Been there. I believe A <laughs> and someone else says I believe 9 like okay you know I don't know how to weigh that you're right? supposed to say bingo yeah right, right. yeah A9 uh, uh, you know so it's kind of always what level does the debate take place how have there's been this explosion of data Usage of data, financial markets, companies, everything. How have you used data increasingly, or have you used data increasingly in your process? There's a lot of information that's a whole lot easier to get. And so it, it means that you can kind of test the stories, that the arguments that managers put forth, forth because they, they no longer have the same kind or degree of information asymmetry that they used to have, or at least you can hone in on the edges that they do have in terms of just having more information. You know, but I think it's um, not as important to the way we think about investing, the long-term horizon, investing in people. You know, the issue is that, I, I say this as a recovering quant, you know, you can't drive the ship. If the ship is to build a roster of managers, you can't get enough data to base a decision without you know, running afoul of a key premise, which is that the engine that produced that is stable, right? right. <laughs> and that nothing's changed. It's clearly not. Right. So, you know, it's something you throw into the mix, but if you think about how these judgments have get made in a qualitatively focused, quantitatively facile group like ours, you know, it's it's more of almost a Bayesian calculation. Like, you know, here's my, you know, I believe this thing with this much probability, this much certainty, and this new bit of information comes in. How much does that change it? I mean, I can't tell you the number of times when, you know, again, just to kind of noodle on something, I'll say to a relatively new colleague, you know, can you just regress, do a little regression on, on this information? It'll help me think about it. And... They'll come back and they'll say, well, that was a complete waste of time. You know, it didn't come close to a significant. Yeah, you know, I was like, I don't care. I need to see the number, right? Because the significance, what I care about isn't the significance of that independent of other analyses, including these qualitative ones. I just want to throw it into the mix. You know, I want to, right. And so I think there's still this judgment thing, which goes beyond just cerebral stuff there's a kind of emotional uh, assessment being made as well that i don't say in a denigrating fashion i believe that there's information i i think investing is a science craft and an art and the important thing is to a be willing to use all three pathways but b make sure you know which pathway you're using at the time like <laughs> right. it's you know there's this art to it but you should really be very explicit to clearing this is an an art judgment not a scientific judgment and i get frustrated when people try and torture some scientific judgment to just justify their gut feeling <laughs> you know, like, so are there opportunities in the market that you're particularly excited about today i think there's probably two ways of answering that you know normally that question is I should be able to tell you, oh, we really like timber or apartments in Brazil or something, you know, some asset-based thing. Again, our business is really about finding great people and partnering with them. We believe that who matters a whole lot more than when you invest. 
and may even matter more than what they actually do. That they're just some some horses you want to hit your wagon to, and you know some of the growing concerns of other customers in the hedge fund world create some opportunities. We were becoming a whole lot more attractive as people who are going to do the intense qualitative work. You know, the managers often have to choose between smart clients and rich clients, and rich clients are a lot easier to deal with, <laughs> you know, until they're not. You know, so I think there's some some firms that we're pretty excited about and I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't want to create competition. I also don't want to let my other son know that this is my favorite son. Yeah, uh, of course. You know, I think that it's a time, again, where it may be better prospects a little bit more off the beaten path. Mm-hmm. I felt that for a while now, but twenty years, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. But but certainly in '09, you didn't have to get cute, right? Sure, that's when it was really good to be yeah. rich. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and how about risks that you're concerned about in the markets? Yeah, in the markets, you know, there's the the obvious one, and this will make this very dated. You know, I assume that people will be listening to this podcast thirty years from now to. Probably a safe assumption. Yeah, uh, or Timeless, as, as yeah. many people will be listening to it thirty years from now as, as, <laughs> as tomorrow. Uh, you know, but wow, it feels like there's a lot of potential volatility in fundamentals in the world, and that doesn't really seem to be in a lot of prices. Yeah, prices make more sense if you just simply in kind of your base case assumption. Right, interest rates are so low, so therefore asset uh, prices uh, are high. Yeah, sure. You know that again, cross sectionally makes sense. But seriously, shouldn't there be some premium for the world waking up to some kind of shock? It seems that all the time people always feel that this is the most risky time. But you'll you'll find someone who will say that. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying it's the most risky time, but I'm willing to say, oh, okay. There's some. Definitely, there's visible some risks that usually aren't visible, and I think that may be because they're usually not as prominent as likely to. You know, yeah, to, and and do you do anything about that in managing the portfolio? As you know, we're pretty circumspect about top-down stuff. You know, even if you're really good, since you're not making a lot of bets, you know, it's pretty easy to come up short, so to speak. Yeah. You know, that being said, we have some outsized exposures to things compared to most investors and in some of those areas one can imagine that it's particularly risky so we we actually have had unusual for us hedge we've got if you were to dig deep enough you'd say oh i bet you they've got a lot of investment in china yeah we do and so maybe we want to take that rmb exposure down a little bit because that's something you could imagine having you know a real break well let's turn to some closing questions a of, mere of you. Yeah. Well, where'd you get that shirt? Golf course, I yeah. think. All right. What advice would you give your children early in their career? In fact, your kids are coming up to that point. My kids are certainly uh, one that's in well past first inning. So uh, I'm going to answer without the presumption that their career is investing. Sure. Uh, if you yeah. want, I can return to no, that. No. There is a cliche about following your passion. I feel that it's true, except for I want to modify that and say, follow your like. The problem with telling someone to follow your passion is it presupposes that they know what passion is. And, you know, it's almost like a dating situation. It's like saying, well, you should go out with the person who's going to be your spouse. Right. <laughs> like, well, I don't know that yet. <laughs> right. And I don't want to have to figure that out before I go out. And that's right. You should iterate on it. So I think you should you know, really go down paths that have a real natural attraction to, to you and you know, not try and plan too far in advance. You, you heard my story. And I think it actually was a source of strength when I finally did get in, uh, interested in investing having done things that I had liked along the way had at least two advantages. One is I learned a lot about a lot of different things that I might not have otherwise learned if I had followed a straight and narrow. But the also the other issue is it enabled me to develop an ego that was 
in the early years, quite detached from investing. So when I first got involved in investing, I could think of myself not as a person who's destined to be an investor. I could think of myself as a guy who was a guy, as a, as a human being who happened to be doing investing now. And that meant that there was a bunch of emotional concerns that weren't necessarily there. If I ended up not doing well in that, well, you know, I'd already not done well in you know another career, <laughs> so it wouldn't have been new to me. Right. Uh, you know, and I think that was an unfair advantage. It's frankly an advantage I don't have anymore because, right. you know, now my ego's pretty tied up in being an investor. Sure. A global financier. Mm, indeed. What is your favorite thing to do that is a complete waste of time? I There's a particular solitaire game called Spider Solitaire that <laughs> is a guilty pleasure because every time I'm doing it, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't know. There's no justification for this. And unlike the classic <laughs> Klondike solder, whatever it's called, th this one has a little bit more skill to it, uh, emphasis in a little bit. I would choose that over some other activities because there's, you know, like I could say, I like stand-up paddle boarding, but that's not a waste of time. That is you know, making me healthier. You know, I... Yeah, well, um, you are a stand-up guy. I am a stand-up guy, yeah, yeah. What phrase that your mother or father repeated to you over and over again, most stuck with you? You know, my parents would say, well, you know, whatever you do, do well, All right? And that unfortunately stuck with me because, <laughs> <laughs> again, it raises the stakes. And also, it turns out that not everything worth doing is worth doing really well. There's some, you know, you kind of want to spend your effort budget wisely. <laughs> you know, there are some <laughs> things where good enough is actually good enough. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, that uh, probably uh, stuck with me. What was your favorite sports moment as a participant or a fan? You know, I, I no one ever has mistaken me for an athlete. I remember that. Yeah. The softball yeah. team, yeah. Yeah, but I went, <laughs> I went to an extremely small school, high school. And so I was able to compete in varsity sports, you know. Where did you grow up? up? I grew up near here, near New Brunswick. And I went to a very small private school where I wrestled and um, was also, there was a sport that no one knew about that only like a few schools in New Jersey played called lacrosse. Yeah, I remember those days. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it was like anybody, <laughs> literally any body that would show up, <laughs> like we need you on the field. I have some memories on that that were pretty fun. I think I learned a lot about what it's like to actually be the weak player on the field and learn about teamwork in a different way that, you know, there were times that even though I was likely to drop the ball of pass to me, it still made sense to pass it to me. And that, that helps. But I think there's been some, some Princeton basketball moments that have been pre pretty, pretty good. There's good. You know, re yeah. recently one that's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Back in the day, there were some Duke basketball moments when I was a, pretty good. you know, uh, alum there. There's still full court pass that uh, kid There's Christian Leitner called. Thir 30 yeah. for 30. On. Yeah. yeah. I hate Christian Leitner or something like that. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that was that, my year. That was pretty good. What's your favorite book? My favorite book of all time. Well, you know me. It's, it's, it's the good book. Is that? No. Uh, <laughs> sorry to offend. Um, I think it's Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene Concept. So that thought of instead of thinking about genes as the way entities reproduce, as the way organisms reproduce, if you think about organisms as the survival mechanism for genes, that was a moment that blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. So what profession other than investing would you like to attempt? Yeah, I mean, I, I do have dreams of getting back on the professional shark wrestling circuit. Short, a very yeah. short-lived yeah. career that yeah. was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I am hoping that there is a way that I can exploit the lessons I've learned that don't relate so much to investing, but relate to organizations and uh, in particular, what it feels like to be the leader of an organization, meaning I don't want to pretend I'm qualified to give any advice on leadership, but I am I do have one set of experiences about uh, what it's like to be a leader 
and you know how to think about how you ask for help, when you ask for help, you know, yeah. when it's an okay sign when you're feeling a little overwhelmed and when it's a sign that, you know, it's not how to kind of more quickly get the confidence to defy, you know, some pressure and how to quickly get the confidence to go in the same direction as the pressure is pushing you because you don't have to prove that you can stand up to the pressure. Yeah. And those so would the, be great uh, lessons to impart yeah, when you get the time. Yeah, so to be some kind of coach or you know, a fantasy about being a really good board member to help uh, a CEO who you know doesn't have that experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. What do you know about life today that you wish you knew 10 years ago? On the eve of the crisis, uh, well, <laughs> that we that, that, that Princeton would survive. Ago, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew for sure that <laughs> Princeton would survive my misjudgments. Um, I, it, it's hard to articulate. I think you get you get much more comfortable with the idea that there are multiple solutions. So when you're pressuring yourself to come up with the right way to fix something, one over time. Um, gets more comfortable realizing that you don't have to land on the perfect solution. You don't have to worry about the choice that seems to be the best choice not being the best choice. Uh, you know, kind of just moving forward can be better. The you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, but I think the the real kick in life is you feel like there's lessons that you learn over and over again, but they're a little bit different. It's kind of like Bob Dylan singing one of his old songs again. It's a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> you know, listen to Jerry Garcia, you know, at age 50 versus, you know, 25. There's so much more there, even though it's the same lyrics. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same guitar riffs. All right. One last I am intentionally trying to make this podcast stand out from some of the other ones yeah, and, and you're doing it yeah, 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 uh, yeah we're sitting down so we're not really standing out but that's yeah. okay yeah. it's uh it's your waning days you are 98 years old sitting in a rocking chair Rosebud. that's what you yeah. love to yeah. do yeah. what advice would you give yourself today i would say that my advice would be that you should do 50 push-ups every day for the next 40 years <laughs> and if you do that, you'll make it to 98. You may make it to 98 other other ways, but you know, I mean, the idea of, first of all, you say 98 uh, as if it's a good thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> like enough already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What advice, uh, I, you know, um, you know, enjoy your grandchildren. Uh, I, I don't have grandchildren now, but that, it's so that, that, that's yeah. great. Uh, Andy, thanks so much for taking the time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. All right. Peace. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you've liked what you've heard, please rate a review on iTunes or Google Play to help others find out about the show. Have a good one and see you next time. Mm-hmm.